Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Um, I'm Steve Roberts. Uh, the picture matches. So that's good. Um, still looking quite old. Um, former engineer on the .NET and PowerShell tooling at AWS, and now a, a DevRel, Dev Advocacy um, person for the, the same set of tools. And in this session, we're going to look at transforming and replatforming ASP.NET monoliths, um, which seems to indicate there are still some around. So what are we going to do? We're going to look at monoliths. But first, we're going to look at how we got to the monolith that we're considering refactoring and replatforming, right? Um, is it good? Is it bad? Right? There was a talk this morning that uh, Wim gave um, about event-driven architectures, right? And we were talking about monoliths and, you know, hey, they're not necessarily all bad, right? You may want to keep them, but at the same time, you may be considering refactoring to microservices. So how are we going to do that, right? What's the typical process for doing that? Are there any tools to help me? Which the last two bullets on that slide should give you an indication of yes, yes, there are, right? And we're actually going through some demos of those tools um, as we go through. So, the monolith, how we got here, right? I've heard it said nobody sets out to write a legacy monolith, right? But we still end up with them. How? Okay. Um, when you think about it, all of the new project scaffolding that we have in our tooling drives us towards a monolith, right? Even in the new .NET core, .NET 5, 6, 7 uh, project scaffolding, it all sends you down the monolithic route. Right? And that's because it's the easiest way to get started. Right? If you think about it, right? as architects, as software developers, we could go into a complete analysis paralysis of like, yeah, I'm going to write this application. It's going to take over the world. It's going to have 300 microservices, and they're all going to communicate like this. And you know, years pass. We haven't shipped a thing. Right? We have a bunch of docs. Great. Our competitors, in the meantime, have shipped a monolith. Right? And they're raking it all in. Right? So it's not necessarily bad. Right? It could be the best approach to getting started. Um, the problem is that we don't tend to see the problems coming down the line, right? So we create the monolith, we start coding on it, um, we get all excited about it, and then we don't take the time to step back and consider where it is that we're actually going, right? And if we're not careful, it ends up quite unwieldy, right? It passes through multiple development teams in its life cycle. Nobody really knows how it works. People leave the company, people join the company, and before you know it, the wall falls in. <laughs> Before you know it, you know, you're looking at a code base of like, oh, what do we do with this? Right? Now we have a problem. So I'm mentioning all this from the start really to point out that you know, monoliths are not necessarily bad as long as we take care with them. Right? Um, not here to say to you, you have to go and take every legacy monolith that you have and convert it to microservices. That's not the point of this talk. But if you are kind of considering this, this is what I've got for you. All right. So let's begin with the typical application lifecycle, right? We all start out with, let's do one thing well, right? It's either a commercial application that we're going to ship, or it's some internal application that we need that's going to last six months, 12 months, and it'll be replaced by IT. Promise, right? So we set out, and we run the scaffolding, and we create a monolith, and, you know, it does the job that we set out to do, right? It's great. We ship it, right? Um, customers like it, right? So the first thing that happens is add some more. Right? It's in the marketplace, or the internal teams are, are enjoying this monolith. Let's, let's, let's extend this, this monolith, right? Let's keep going. Um, now, the thing is, when you get into this mindset, and, and I've been there, right, in my career as a software dev, you don't necessarily think where you're grafting this functionality on. You just add it wherever you can make it fit, right? Because you've got deadlines. You've got to get things out the door, right? Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Um, we just keep adding on more and more and more, and, and off we go. Nobody's really looking at the horizon, right? We're still focused on, yeah, this app's going to last six months, 12 months, we'll replace it, whatever. Um, just add it on. What could possibly go wrong? Well, we keep going, right? We keep adding piles of bricks, right? Piles of new functionality. Um, at this point, perhaps the product is wildly popular, right? Management like, you know, three weeks, we need to ship this massive new feature. Get on with it. Do it, right? Um, let's get it out the door. Let's make some money. Fine. No problem with that. But again, we're not taking that time to consider problems looming on the horizon. So the problem is that we get to a point where we say, oh, um, we've built this teetering pile of blocks in our monolith. All right. um, what do we do now? Right? So remember, this application might have been one that was only going to be around for six months. We're now 10 years down the line. All right? We've extended this over time. Technology that it was using maybe are going out of um, lifespan now, right? Let's say SQL Server 2008 R2, right? It's now end of life, right? What are we going to do, right? Um, and as I mentioned, there's a good chance that the people who created this application are no longer at the company, right? Or they've moved on to new roles and they don't really have time to help us 
dig through this to figure out what are we going to do. Right? So we're faced with a problem. What are we going to do? So let's step back a minute and consider why refactors and microservices. Right? So a monolith as it stands is limiting. Okay? When we deploy, we have to deploy the entire application stack. Right? Even if we're in the cloud, the whole application needs to go to the cloud. We can't just deploy bits of it. We can't say to team A over here, you deploy your bit on a different cadence to team B over here. Right? Everyone has to collaborate. Everybody has to be on the same push cycle to get features out. It may be that, let's say, a security fit issue comes up, right? or you need to do an urgent patch in the middle of the night. Right? You push the feature out, and then you realize, or as you're about to push the feature out, you realize that somebody in team C has actually committed a change to the mainline branch that isn't ready to go out yet. Right? I know it shouldn't happen, but it does. Right? Happened to me. Right? Completely by accident. No blame on the developer concern. They just pushed the wrong branch and nobody noticed. We had a security issue. We had to push. This was pre-AWS. We had an issue. We need to push a, an update out the door on the monolith. The wheels ground to a halt immediately when somebody spotted this, this commit in the history. and like, hang on, what's this? Right? And then we had to go and unpick that commit, redo the changes, significantly delaying what was going on. All right? That kind of ties into the limited um, ability to experiment, right? Because everyone's on this same cadence. We need to stay away from the main branch. It's limiting experimentation. Ideally, we want all individual teams to take ownership of their own component or components and deliver it on their own cadence you know, with API versioning and so on that we can then reuse across the other parts of the application. Right? We don't want to be pushing this monolith. If demand spikes right, in a monolith, Let's say demand on the front end spikes, right? So we start to vertically scale the entire infrastructure to support that app. Um, that's costly, right? We're using more resources than we actually need. Maybe it's just a small inner component that we need to scale, not the outer or the inverse of that, right? Um, so we can also end up with a case if we don't scale where a, a piece of the, fun the application is receiving a high, a high number of requests. It's starving other processes of resources to get their work done, okay? And you know, intent, that can lead on then to a crash, right? We've starved some internal process. The whole application goes down. Now the pages are going off, and we don't really want that in the middle of the night. So the significant benefits to, to microservices, OK? Um, teams are independent. They build, test, release without depending on other teams. Now, I say that, yes, there is a dependency, right? If teams have an API, then they need to be responsible for versioning that API, right? At AWS. One of the things we practice is we never deprecate. We try really, really hard not to deprecate APIs to all our services. Right? Things you had running 10 years ago should still run today. The API calls should still be there. Um, it's not always possible, but in general, that should happen. So we need clean API versioning. Um, the culture of ownership, you know, autonomy. Right? Teams are independent on their own cadence. It also compartmentalizes that complexity. They understand how their component works. Somebody in another part of the organization that's just consuming that component shouldn't need to know. Right? They just go to the API. Um, the failures are localized. Right? If a particular service goes down, the whole app doesn't go down. Let's consider an order processing app right? um, or an e-commerce app. If the back-end order processing service goes down, does it really matter? As long as the front end is still operating, we can queue up the orders right, and then batch and catch them up later on. Right? We don't have to bring down the entire application. And we have more resource-efficient scaling, right? If, as I said before, the front end is getting hit with a number of requests, we can scale the front end. We don't necessarily need to scale the individual services or the inverse, depending on what's going on. But those benefits come with challenges, right? Consider our monolith that's grown over time, right? 10 years, 15 years, whatever it happens to be. You know what the lifespan of .NET framework is now? It's got to be getting on for 20 years or more, right? Um, it's difficult to identify the parts to extract to make a good service, right? especially if the original authors of that code have left the company. Right? Who knows how it works anymore? Um, or we, may be, we need to group functionality based on business domains. We don't actually understand them, or they're not documented, or it's not clear. Right? Business logic leeches within the monolith all over the place. It gets quite tricky. Um, we may need to use multiple tools. Right? So we have some source code. And we have a, run, a running instance of the application. Right? Ideally, it would be nice to be able to correlate those metrics of the runtime together to see where the hotspots are. Okay? So now we're looking at, OK, how can we scale this part of the application independently of the rest? Right? And performance metrics can guide us down that route. And finally, you know, we need to perform manual work to carve out that functionality. Right? It's not easy on picking that monolith, right? trying to figure out what, what works here? Where, where does this code come from? Especially if you consider modern dependency injection. 
right? It, the, the linkages are not always immediately apparent until you extract that code and you go and run it in production and under a certain set of circumstances, it just falls down, right? Because you didn't see that dependency inside the code, whereas automated tooling could probably pick that up for you. So we go ahead anyway, right? We identify some code in the application that we want to drag out to a, to a new microservice. Awesome, let's go ahead and do it. What could possibly go wrong, right? The whole pile of bricks comes down on us, hopefully not in production, but you know, sometimes. Um, and now we're stuck. We're all scrambling to, to fix the problem, either roll back or try and adjust um, what it is that we're doing. So how do we get to that pile of bricks, right? This is the traditional refactoring process, right? So first we take our monolithic application, right? This huge code base that's grown over time, and we need to identify what part are we going to extract, right? What's a good candidate to extract? Is it something that's resource intensive that we want to break away from the application? Is it something that um, we just want to isolate and just have it called periodically, right? We don't need it running all the time. Is it something that we want to scale independently? The reasons differ, right? But ultimately, you're going to identify some piece of, some piece of the application that we want to extract. Then we're going to group the classes related to that together, right? Now, that involves digging through the source code, digging through the docs. You all have docs for your applications, right? Architectural docs, wikis, you know, yeah, yeah. I see where you're coming from, right? So you spend time digging through these applications, going and finding Fred or Mary in the canteen, you know, to say, hey, you, you all know where a canteen is, right? Cafe? Yeah. Work out? Yeah, okay. Just checking. I'm English. <laughs> um, you know, we sometimes use terms that... This side of the pond, nope. Um, yeah, so you go and find Fred and Mary in the canteen and say, hey, you remember this application that we started 10 years ago? Do you, do you remember how this bit works? Because we're thinking of pulling it out. And they kind of like look at you blankly, like, what application, right? Um, don't know anything about it, because that's the natural defense. I don't want to get pulled into this mess. No, 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 I don't know anything about it, right? So we have this problem of now we've got to go dig through the code ourselves, figure out the classes, figure out the interrelationships. What are we going to extract? Then we decide that, you know what, the classes that we've identified, the classes that we've grouped, are not necessarily 100% clean to extract, right? We need to make some changes to them, make some, some adjustments so that, or tooling, or and when we're inside our editor extracting the code, we can more easily pull that out. We're making it a little bit more tool friendly, right? Or at least a little bit more, let's call it developer friendly at this point, right? Um, we can take that class, move it without breaking anything else. So then we extract it. Okay, we've got our new microservice, right? We've got our new projects. We've moved the code files across. We've fixed the dependencies, hopefully. Then we build and deploy it, right? So we have to run this code. There's no point extracting a microservice without deploying it somewhere, right? So we're going to deploy it to some kind of staging environment, hopefully not production, but maybe, I don't know, whatever. Um, we deploy it, and we start testing it. So we start testing the API that we put around the front of it. Then we have to go back to the monolith and now remove that code. Right, or at least comment it out, if nothing else, right? So somehow turn it off and make, it, make us call the new microservice in whatever environment it's, it's been running in. Um, so we're eliminating the duplicate code, eliminating the microservice code, and then we test our application, we fix the bugs, and then we release it. And in theory, everything is good with the world. <laughs> in theory, right? Um, that's a lot of manual work, right, to refactor like one service. Then we have to go around the loop again. Right? and just keep doing it, keep doing it. Ideally, we would like to get to a point where all of the internal service code in the monolith has been extracted, or at least the bits that make sense, and we leave the UI components alone. There's no point moving those. Right? We can just re-platform that application then. Right? So what's available to help? So enter AWS Microservice Extractor for .NET. So this is a free tool. It's one of what we call our assistive tools. Um, so it's an assistive tool. So it basically analyzes your monolithic application, your ASP.NET application, and identifies the parts that you could extract. Now, there are two ways of working at this. You can do it manually and say, yeah, I want these classes, having seen a visualization of it, that I want to extract, okay, and then have it do the work. Or you can use the new ML recommendations engine that's built into it, that's in preview right now, where it will analyze the app and say, hey, these, these could be services that you could extract. Right, and I'll show you those very briefly in a little while. So it... It has three key things that are, that are important. One is it, it more quickly identifies the parts of an application that you could extract, or you can use it to help more quickly identify those parts. Okay? Um, it actually does the refactoring for you. So once you've identified the classes that you want to pull out, you can then extract those as a group. It will set up the separate project, a separate solution for you, and then you can go in and just make the last-minute tweaks that you need to refactor. Now, 
it is an automated tool, but no automated tool is perfect, right? There is always some work to be done. But the, what we're looking to do here is remove the undifferentiated heavy lift of extracting this code out from a microservice, right? The more it can do for us, the better. If I then just go and just fix a few things, that's ideal, right? But it doesn't do 100% of it. Let's just be clear on that from the start, right? Um, so yeah, so we have this tool available. It's free. Um, it does currently require an AWS account. Currently, I, I say currently because it's similar to our porting assistant tool that I'm going to show also later on for replatforming, which started out live needing an AWS account and has now been changed, so you don't need that. You can use it for anything. Hopefully, this will follow suit. I'm not part of the dev team, so I can't commit to it, but my fingers are crossed. Um, so where does it actually help? So remember that process I just showed you? The boxes in here that are changed color to green are where the tool helps. So I'm identifying, grouping, extracting, and then that refactor of the monolith later on. You'll notice that that's green and red. It doesn't do all of it, like I just mentioned, right? It'll do the majority of it, or depending on the, the size of the monolith, but it, you have to go in and it'll still do some work. Um, the initial refactoring to make it more to your code more tool friendly, yeah, you might have to do that yourself. Um, the deployment, obviously, you do that yourself. And test and release, you do that yourself. But it significantly helps on those identify, group, and extract pieces. What does it support? Well, .NET Framework from 3.5 up to 4.8. Um, it has to be an ASP.NET MVC application in C Sharp. It also works on ASP.NET Core MVC applications, so the, more new, the newer um, application types. It doesn't move your source code files. The idea is that technically they're going to stay in the UI anyway. You're not going to refactor that to a microservice, okay? So it doesn't touch those, and it doesn't refactor databases. But as far as the application code goes, it's fairly broad spectrum. So how do you use it? Well, just like you would in a traditional loop. You use it to identify the groupings, either using the new ML recommendations or by doing it yourself with a visualization, um, which I'll show you shortly. Then you prepare the code, go through it, make whatever changes you need, analyze it for extraction, extract it, refactor the monolith, and you're done. Well, you're not really, because you're going to go back to the start and do it again. Because you'll be so successful at using this, you'll want to go and do another one, right? Um, but yeah, it is an iterative loop, right? It may, it may be that your monolith is just like, yeah, we're going to extract one service and we're done, right? Great. If not, you're going to go around in loops doing it. Now, once you've extracted the service, now we're looking at potentially replatforming, right? So imagine our ASP.NET monolith application tied to Windows because of the .NET framework, right? We want to move it to the cloud, right? Sure, we could stay on Windows, right? We could run in a Windows container, but Windows containers are large. They take time to load. Right? Maybe we want to take advantage of Linux. So ideally, we want to move it to the new versions of .NET. Right? .NET Framework 4.8, that's it. We're done. Right? We're going to get critical fixes only from now on. .NET 5, 6, 7, 8, so on into the future. That's where the future's going. Right? Um, maybe we don't want to pay for licensing anymore. We can just run this thing on Linux. Right? It's been made cross-platform for a reason. We may as well take advantage of it. Um, the percentage savings on here are related to AWS instances. I can't talk to other cloud providers. Um, ARM64 support, if you're looking at that, right? Um, AWS has its Graviton3 um, custom processor chips for ARM64. We've had them for quite a while now. Um, those will give you up to 40% better price performance. So you can you go and do with a smaller instance size and get the same performance. Right? So worth taking a look at. And of course, Microsoft did a fantastic work in .NET 5 and onwards from, for getting ARM64 support. So you might take advantage of that. And it may be that you're looking to go fully serverless, right? maybe on Lambda. Does anybody know you can run an ASP.NET Core web application on Lambda? Right? Um, it's maybe an anti-pattern, I don't know. But you can do it. right? Um, so we get ourselves onto .NET. It opens up a significant number of doors. Replatforming is hard. Right? We have incompatible NuGet packages. We have API changes, incompatible APIs. There's a bunch of manual steps. Sounds like refactoring, right? We've got to create new projects, create the pro project dependencies, copy code around. It doesn't sound like a very attractive option, right? So this is where the porting assistant comes in. So this supports .NET Framework 3.5 onwards, and it basically scans your application looking for incompatible NuGet uh, references, um, code, APIs, and so on, and will generate a report which you can then go off and uh, use online, or inside the tool, you can start to port that application, right? or that particular microservice, to a new version of .NET. And again, it will take you a significant chunk of the way. 
right? It's not going to do everything, right? There are some APIs you can have to recode. It's just the, the nature of the beast, right? Um, where it can't make changes, I'll show you later on, it will actually annotate your code. So you know where you need to go in and make changes. Um, but it handles the conversion of the project files from the old style, MS Build style, to the new .NET format, which is a significant amount of effort if you've ever done that by hand. Um, it updates the, the code, NuGet packages. You can select particular NuGet packages, or you can leave the tool to actually just take you up to the latest uh, and handle all that for you. So who's done with slides? Should we go take a look? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so what I've got is an application here called Gadgets Online. Whoops, come back. There we go. I want this window. Thank you. All right. So this is actually currently running. It's a very simple MVC application, um, typical of what we might have written 10, 15 years ago. The, the UI style deliberately matches. Have you noticed that? Of the old style applications, right? Um, it's a little bit fuzzy on this screen, but you know we have an inventory here of, of, of gadgets that we can go off and presumably buy on an e-commerce site, right? So we have an inventory behind this. So let's go take a look at the code for a second before we start extracting it. And what we have. Here we have a typical ASP.NET um, project here. So we've got a bunch of controllers, right? MVC. Here's our home controller. When it launches, there we go. Right? And you can see that when it's called on index, we call, spin up a new inventory class. We get the best sellers and we put those on the home page. Right? Pretty standard stuff. If we go into the services layer here, we can see we have an inventory service right? inside the application. We have an online entity, a DB context, which we just use to get product from the, the back-end SQL Server store. Right? So let's go and analyze this app to see what we could potentially break out of it. Right? Um, so inside Microservice Extractor, here it is. Once you download and install, it's a standalone tool that you download. And it requires a couple of settings before it gets started. So we're going to settings here. And if I go into edit, right. So first it needs a region. Right now it's supported in US East 1 and US West 2. That's our Virginia and Oregon uh, regions. The US East one is required if you want to use the new ML recommendations engine right now. Hopefully, when we go GA, that won't be the pro you won't need to do that, but that's where it is today. Um, again, I mentioned it needs AWS credentials um, for the moment, so I have a credential profile. Most importantly, it needs a working directory because when it actually changes your code, it's going to copy the extracted service code into that subfolder as well as the updated monolith. It won't change your code in place, right? So you're going to get a copy of everything, two projects. So I'm already set up, so I'm not going to change this. So let's go in and onboard this application. So let's call it Gadgets, Gadgets Online. This is the point at which I lose the ability to type while I'm speaking at the same time. OK, so we give it a name. And then we need to point it at the source file. So we're actually going to point it at the solution file. So here we are, CDC, Gadgets Online. So I'm going to point it at my solution file. If I need a custom version of MS Build or I need some custom MS Build switches, I can supply those in here because it will build the app as part of the analysis. I don't need to make any changes. And then earlier on, I mentioned runtime profiling, right? So if we want to look at hotspots in the application to help guide us as to what we might want to extract, we can do that here. Uh, I'm not going to use it in this particular case, but you could import a CSV file of profiling metrics. And there's also, as you do this, you can actually analyze it for .NET portability using the porting assistance that are too tied together. Um, now, you might want to do this if you're thinking of replatforming the entire application as you go, right? This is one of those it depends scenarios, right? If the monolith is small and you might want to port the monolith first and then refactor, if it's large, you might want to port a service and then replatform the monolith, right? So it, it, it's a classic DA, developer advocate, it depends answer, right, to, to that kind of question. But you can do it. I'm not going to do it here because I'm going to show you how we would port the, the service. Uh, later. So I'm going to click on board. And uh, this will take a few moments. It's actually pretty quick to analyze. Any questions while it does that? The tool is free. Yeah. Yeah, but does it create like a VM to download the application and all the operations that it needs? Do you need a VM to download it? 
that we said? Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a Windows desktop application. So you do need Windows because it's scanning a .NET Framework application. You could put it on a VM if you wanted to. Um, I'm running it locally, obviously, but, um, but no, it requires just Windows, um, .NET Framework version for whatever you're running, um, you're going to analyze, and that's it. Yeah, this is running on my machine oh, right okay, here. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. That, yeah. That was on the cloud. yeah. No, you can run it in the cloud if you want, uh, but on a VM in the cloud that you'd have to remote into, right? So, okay, so it's analyzed. So we're going to go in and take a look at it, and you can see it gives us some initial data of the MS bill log, etc. We're not bothered about that. What I want to get to is the visualization. So here's the visualization, and uh, it's going to look a little bit blurry on the screen, so I apologize. But basically, what it's done is it's it's taken the classes in the application and put them onto the visualization graph. And it's showing the, the interdependencies between those classes. Okay, so we can zoom in and out of these, so you can see a little bit more. Scroll it around, so on. But you can see all of the the namespace classes inside here. There are a couple of other views that we can look at as well. So if we go to alternative views, we can look at it from a namespaces view. Let me just scroll this in, so we can see the classes inside the namespaces with their dependencies. I don't know if you can see the arrows at the back of the room, but there's arrows connecting all those classes. Or we can go into something called island view, which is like looking at islands of functionality. Right? So these are just different visualizations that you might want to work with. Um, I'm going to go back to the main view for now. And you can also create additional canvases in here, so you can start to group classes onto different canvases uh, as you go forward. This all gets persisted. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at that inventory. So let's just pull it in, search on inventory here, and you show, it's showing me the gadget online services inventory class. So let's just click on that. It's going to highlight that class in the visualization. Right? So I'm kind of interested in extracting this. Is it going to work, right? So what I would do is I'm going to right click on the class. Actually, I'm going to clear the, the, the filter out. I'm going to right click on the class and say add node to group. So I'm kind of going around my, my application now looking at the classes, looking at the dependencies, and like, yeah, I'm going to pull this, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this, and so on, and make a service, OK? And I can either add these to an existing group that I've already set up, um, or in this case, I'm going to create a new group. So let's call it inventory. Tory group, do the work. And if I want, I can have a nice pretty color um, so I can distinguish things on the display. So now I've got that first class in the group. I can go off to other classes. Um, I'm not going to add it here, but let's just say I wanted to add the this POCO down here, plain LC sharp object into the class. I could just add node to group in here and then say, yeah, add it into my existing group. So I'm pulling the classes together, right? I'm using visualization to help me identify what I want. I don't want to change that, though. So, so I've got my inventory group. Let's say I've got all the classes in there I need. It already knows the dependencies, so it knows what it needs to pull alongside that inventory class. I don't need to go and do that myself, OK? That, addition, that additional piece of adding classes to the group is only for unrelated classes that I also want to pull in. So once I've done that, I can click on the group and say, you know, extract it. So let's extract, let's get rid of this banner. So let's extract it. So it wants a name for the new service, so we'll call it inventory service. And as we scroll down here, we can see that the classes it's going to pull out is based off the inventory class plus all of the dependencies that it's going to pull those through. And at the bottom, there's this thing called method invocations to the extracted service. So what this is going to do, I have two options. I can either have the monolith updated or a copy of the monolith updated to call the extracted service via a HTTP call, or I can leave the monolith alone and just call the, the original code. Okay? So if I just want to pull a service out and not change the monolith, that would be the one I go for. In this particular case, I'm going to use remote method invocation, so I'm going to pull it out and update the monolith. Click Extract. So this will take, again, a few moments. So what it's going to do now is analyze, again, analyze those classes, figure out all the dependencies it needs to pull, because um, there are slightly more than what it showed on the display, and then set up a new project for the extracted microservice and a new project for the, mo for the monolith with a solution in each case. And this is all going into that work folder I showed you earlier on. So if we jump into work here, nothing right now. In a moment, there it goes. So you'll notice it's put it under a random named folder. And in a moment, we'll see extracted service. There it is. And we'll see the monolith. So earlier on, while it's doing that, actually, it only takes a few moments, but earlier on I mentioned about the ML-based recommendations. So you'll see this button over here called Get Grouping Recommendations. That's the new ML engine. So basically, now, in case you're worried, this doesn't send any of your code to AWS, okay? <laughs> Don't panic. 
<laughs> what it does is it, it knows the class dependent. It knows the class hierarchy. It knows that this is a controller, this is a view, and so on, right? There's a back-end mod, ML model that's been trained on sample ASP.NET applications and reference architectures, okay? So it uses that in conjunction with these dependencies to figure out groupings that you might want to take as a service, all right? So, and what it does is, once you click this, it takes, I think in this particular application case, it took about five minutes to generate the automatic recommendations, all right? So I've pre-done it, but basically we scroll in, you can see that it's done what I did in that initial part of the demo where I was selecting classes manually and then adding with group. It's done that for me. Now, I, I can take this as it stands and then extract a group. So I could literally go into here and say, hey, extract like auto group two. But you'll notice it's included this store controller. And that's because of the dependency between the two and the inventory. I don't really want that. So in this particular case, I would remove that class from the group, right? It's, it's doing it off dependencies in the, in the model. But there is that alternative. So if you don't want to go around that visualization, clicking classes yourself, you can make this as your starting point and then just adjust this. So let's go back to the thing here. OK, so it's extracted the, the, the new service. It's extracted the, the monolith. And it gives you the path to the extracted data. I happen to know where they are. So let's just jump into a new Visual Studio. And we'll open up the extracted microservice first. So we're going to go to. EDC, and uh, work, the random folder, extracted services, inventory service. Now, one little gremlin that I've complained to the service team about, and I hope they're going to fix this very quickly, is you'll notice it's called the solution name and the project name the same as the monolith. Ideally, I want this to be called inventory service, right? So they're taking a look at fixing that, but just something to be aware of. But at least it's not changing your code in your repo, right? It's making a copy of it, so it's not so bad. So if we take a look at Gadgets Online now, the extracted service, you'll notice there's a new controller in here, inventory controller, which, when it comes up, there we go, which you'll see is just an API, all right? Standard ASP.NET API. So all the methods are in here. You'll notice there's this endpoint param store. Um, this is an endpoint param. This is how the uh, code is actually going to new up the inventory class. So we use this store, and behind the scenes, Take a look at inventory. Here's my inventory class, okay, that we saw in the original monolith, extracted out. So the inventory controller will new up this class when it's called, call it, and return best sellers. Okay? So everything is wrapped behind an API. Now, when we get into here, you'll see there's an additional here. Migrations has appeared, right? This is because it's pulled the DB context out, right? So it knows the migrations are related to that somehow. We don't need them, so we're going to delete that. It also pulled out a DB initializer for the models. We take a look here, which again, we don't need either of those classes. So we would typically remove those at some point. I'm going to leave them in for now. Um, but you'll notice that there's the, the models are here, the, the, that particular inventory class needs, and so on and so forth. Right? So one more thing remains to be done before we can build this code, and that is to update a NuGet package. So assuming I can still type. How are we doing for time? Oh, good. Okay, okay. So I want to do update package. Package uh, dash reinstall. Told you I'd lose the ability to type. Microsoft.aspnet. Assuming I get the right package name. Dot web API dot client, I think is the right one. Fingers crossed. So once this is added, it should build. And the reason I want it to build is important for the next step with Porting Assistant, right? When you go to port and re-platform, the project has to build in order to be fully analyzed, right? So that's why I'm making this change. And now is the time at which my internet connection gets slow. All right, here we go. All right, so hopefully all being well, we can now rebuild the solution. Cool, it builds. I have an extracted microservice ready to deploy behind an API. All right? That wasn't so hard. Let's go take a look at the monolith, what left, what happened to that. Because you might be thinking now, well, how does it actually get called? So, new project. And again, we'll go back to that extracted work folder here. And we go into the modified application code and load the solution for the monolith.
here it is. So we'll go and take a look at the endpoint, the home controller that's in here now. So we take a look at the home controller. And you'll notice something's changed here. Notice it's working through an, an endpoint factory to get to the inventory, right? Because the inventory now exists behind an HTTP API. It can't just new it up, right? But it can. That's the key thing with this tool. We don't have to adopt the microservice at this point. We could take that microservice and deploy it and leave the monolith alone, right? And continue using the old code until we're happy, and then we can just switch over. And the way that works is it adds an endpoint adapter based on the adapter pattern. And inside there is a web config file, and you'll see this remote routing to microservice switch. By default, it's set to true, right? We're going to call the new microservice when we deployed it, right? Here it's set to false. Oh, sorry, set to true. We can turn that false, and it will call the original code. And the way it does that is through the inventory endpoint, which is here, our inventory endpoint. There's the methods that were on the inventory class. Then we have a factory class that basically reads that configuration setting and then decides if I'm going to use the remote call. It makes a remote invocation. Otherwise, it news up the local endpoint. Okay, so I can test locally. Can switch on the remote, etc. So I have that flexibility. Let's see, anything else to change in here? So what else would I change at this point in this cloud? So you'll notice if we go back to the uh, extracted microservice that what this is actually returning, uh, if I go to inventory here, so you'll notice that this is returning uh, model classes, so product and so on, right? That's not ideal, right? So what I would probably do at this point is I would change those to be data transfer objects. So I'd make those up, and then I'd return those with a conversion. Okay? And I would change the monolith to use those DTOs. Right? I'm not going to do that today, because that's just code. Right? But that's something you would probably want to do. OK, so we've extracted the service. We have the monolith. Now we could take a look at the extracted code. We could look at, compare it to our repo, set up our new project. It's, well, we've got our new project ready. Set up a new repo ready, and so forth. Right? But the code is still working on .NET Framework. Right? So we've moved forward but we've not moved that far forward, right? We're still reliant on needing Windows to actually deploy this and host this. So let's take a look at Porting Assistant. And in Porting Assistant, so here it is. So just like Microservice Extractor, this has um, settings that you can uh, create. So inside here, these days now with the latest version, you only need to set your target .NET version, .NET 6 in this case. Eventually it'll be 7, 8, so on. Um, you don't need credentials for this, so this one's totally free. Um, what I'm going to do is go back to assess solutions, and I'm going to assess a new solution. So I'm going to go and take a look at that microservice. So I'm going to go to my CDC folder, work. I'm going to open that and assess it. Now, as I mentioned, for porting assistant to do a complete analysis, the, the code has to build, okay? which is why I went through changing the NuGet package and removing the migrations classes, because that would have caused the build fail. But once it's actually in there, it'll start analyzing it. And then in a few moments, we should get the assessment complete. Now we can go and take a look at the visualization of it. Any questions while I just wait for it to finish? No. No, you can use this with any .NET application without needing AWS. Thank you. Well, understanding the complexities uh, in a project like page navigation, JavaScript files, and all that, I'm ca quite amazed that it ca can be possible to be to for can to it port the navigation? Yeah, no, I mean the 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 extraction of the microservice. Oh, the extraction. Yeah, yeah. it's. It um, what happened with? Uh, when you have in a big project, many views, you have view navigation, you have a, a, a shared view that has all the menus of the application. How does that work? In that it won't touch that. So it won't go anywhere near the UI components. I mean, you, you can select them in the, the microservice extractor and tell it to try and extract, but it, it won't work. Oh, it's right? just for business it's rules. Just That's for it. business logic, yeah, the services you want to extract. The UI, you would leave in the monolith, right? Um, Typically, this is taking a little while longer than I would like. So, um, how big can it? How, how big can be the application for the extractor? As big as you like. A monolith with t 
10 gigabytes with more than 100 Yeah, floors. I mean, the, the size of the application, uh, if you didn't hear back the, the questions about the size of the application that supports, the actual size, all it's going to do is affect the analysis time. Okay, so the larger the app, the longer the analysis time. But I am not aware of any limits on size. Um, same thing for the porting assistant, which of course is now taking me a long time and defying what I just said, because it's a tiny project, but anyway. Oh, there we go, we're done. All right, so I'm gonna click on Gadgets Online. So remember, this is the extractive microservice, not the, the monolith. Okay, so we get some basic information about how many incompatible APIs are in the, in the project, number of incompatible NuGet packages that need to be changed, Porting actions 24 means there's currently 24 items that you need to look at to get this onto .NET 6. So if we're going to project references, we're going to get the most exciting visualization in the world, right? Because this is a single project application now, right? So what I'm going to do is let's go and take a look at a different project, give you a more feel. This is a, another web application, MVC web application. This is a monolith that has not had anything extracted from it, right? So multiple projects. If I go to project references here, you see we get this visualization of all the, the component, the projects that make up that project, right? And what it's showing you is the dependencies between the projects. Because when I'm porting, if I'm porting an entire monolith, I want the most bang for my book from the initial ports, right? I don't want to port a project that's maybe dependent on by one other thing. I want the majority, you know, where the, where the heavy hitters are. Who's depending on this the most? Port that first, right? That's the, that's the bulk of the work, right? So this is what this is showing you. So, the arrows show you the incoming dependencies to that project component. So if this was like a big real world application, I'd be looking and thinking, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna port models first, or I'm gonna port Microsoft Web Common first, but the Web MVC app, maybe later on, because it depends on other projects, nothing depends on it, okay? So you have this, this data you can go through and decide where you're gonna start. So let me get back to my um, enthralling project graph here, references graph. Um, we got a NuGet packages, it tells me the NuGet packages compatibility, et cetera, which ones I can just automatically roll forward to, which ones are gonna need a replacement. You'll notice it even suggests a potential replacement if that's known. This is all based off a rules engine that's open source that people can contribute to. Um, APIs, it'll tell me all the APIs in the project that either it doesn't know anything about or it knows for sure are incompatible, I need to make changes to, and so on. There's also a Visual Studio version of this, by the way, that you can run inside Visual Studio. Um, extension, so that, that can be helpful. I use the standalone tool because I'm using it with, with ME. Let's go and port it. So when I port the project to .NET 6, I have choice. I can either do a process similar to Microservice Extract where it copies the new code to a new location, or I can modify the code in place. Now, if this was a Git repo, I would use the modify in place, right? I would create a branch and modify in place, right? which is what I'm gonna do here anyway. Even I don't have a Git repo, but that would be my recommendation. Okay. So let's just click save, and you'll say, okay, we're gonna to go to .NET 5.6. For a known package here, it's gonna update web client to 5.28. Um, let's click port. And again, this will take a few moments. And again, if your project is really big, right, this is gonna take longer, so. But usually it's fairly quick. <laughs> Done, okay. So if we now go and take a look at the uh, microservice, you'll see it wants to reload in Visual Studio, right? The project file just changed. The project file was changed from MS Builds, the .NET Framework MS Build format, to the new .NET format automatically for me. All the NuGet references were updated. Now, this code as it stands right now will not compile, right? Remember I said all, automation tools can't do the whole of the thing for you, right? It's getting closer and closer and closer, but today they don't do everything, so you have to expect there's gonna be a little bit of work to go and clean up, right? But if we take a look at the project, Click on it. Let's go and see if we can just edit this project here. Get the project file. You can see that it's ripped out all the old references, it's putting new package references, so on and so forth, right? So that's all done for me. That would be a lot of work um, if this was a, a really large project. Uh, what else has it done? So let's take a look at the inventory class. I don't think it changed anything inside here. No, nope, that's good. Um, if we take a look at the inventory controller, what we'll notice is there's some comments in here. Route prefix is no longer supported. So it's guiding me as to where I now need to make subsequent changes. Any changes it could do automatically are done. We don't have to worry about those. These are just the ones that it can't do automatically. You're gonna have to go back in and take a look, right? And this is why I recommend 
if you have a Git repo, so you, you, you extract your microservice, you add it to a Git repo, then you do the port in the Git repo in place. Now you can do a diff of the two files and you'll very clearly see where all the, the markers from the translation, the, what we call the code translation system, CTA, which is a part of the porting assistant, is guiding you of what changes you need to make. Okay? But at the end of the day, that's saved a significant amount of time. If this was a, you know, a big microservice or a big piece of code, um, you don't have to do all this yourself. Let's see what else has it done. Uh, I think actually there's a online entities here. Where's it gone? Do, 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 do. I'm looking for some code. There. Ah, there we go. There's another example of what it puts in. You can see it's guiding me that I need to use the configuration manager to get the connection string, not the way it was done before. Right. So I'm getting that help. Okay. So that's the microservice extractor. That's the porting assistant. So let's head back to the slides to finish up. And I have a few resources for you. So this is for the microservice extractor. Um, the deck's been uploaded, so you should have it available after the conference, but there you go. So um, the download link, uh, a couple of PDFs or white papers on microservice journeys for .NET. There's also a self-guided workshop that takes that sample application I just showed, and you can go through it all the way, including adding DTOs and all the rest of the objects to fully stand up a microservice with the, the monolith calling it. And the porting assistant. Um, I should have mentioned the porting assistant itself is open sourced. So it's all on GitHub. The actual SDK, you can use it in your own applications if you want. So if you wanted to build custom tooling around the porting assistant engine, you could do that. Uh, it's do available on NuGet. The standalone app UI and the Visual Studio extension are both open sourced. Um, and it's supported for Visual Studio 2022 and 2019. And then, and this is literally hot off the press, um, I think it was last week, maybe the week before, we launched a new toolkit for .NET refactoring. Um, so this is supported for Visual Studio 2019 and 2022, and it's like a combination of the porting assistant and the microservice extractor. Now, all dues being paid, it doesn't quite do exactly what both of those standalone applications do today, but it's still worth a look if you're into refactoring your code. It will, it, because it, it does the, the, some of the extraction, some of the porting, but it can also do deployments. So what it does is it takes the resulting code, containerizes it, and then deploys it to AWS. And then you can start testing it in the cloud. Okay? Um, so it's got a kickstart for, for getting started on that. So again, this is available on the Visual Studio Marketplace. Um, again, it's free to use, um, and so on. I'm going to finish with a couple of shameless plugs, because I can. Um, if you're into .NET on AWS, we have two books coming. Um, one is currently available. The, the O'Reilly book on the right is actually a free download from the AWS.NET website. So aws.amazon.com slash .NET, D-O-T net. Uh, you can download that for free. Um, or I'm co-author on a new book that's coming out in December. Um, and there's a whole chapter on microservice extractor and porting assistant uh, inside that book. Um, so yeah, with that, thanks very much for coming along and listening. Appreciate it. And uh, hope you find it useful. <laughs>